Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. My guests today are David Strokia and Brandon Jones. David Strokia is the Senior Vice President and Managing Director at NetSmart, a healthcare software company. David works closely with the clinical development and product teams to ensure technology solutions and services at NetSmart allow clients across behavioral health and human services to thrive within the emerging models of care. Brandon Jones is the CEO of Triad, the leading provider of education, community, and career resources for behavioral and mental health professionals. Brandon has 20 years of experience in education, ed tech, business leadership, and people development. Before coming to Triad, Brandon spent nearly two decades at Kaplan Test Prep, starting his career as an SAT teacher and working his way up to become the president of Kaplan's Test Prep's largest operating unit. Today, we're talking about advancing technology for improved mental health care. Dave, Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Graham. Great to be here with you. Nice to have you both here and uh, looking forward to our show today. You know, as a clinician myself, technology has advanced so much since I've been in for the last uh, oh, so 25 years. And there's so many things that are making things more productive, more efficient. And I'm excited about talking today about NetSmart's involvement in that. Dave, I know that your goal mission at NetSmart is to help improve clinicians' delivery of care. And one way you guys are doing that is by improving the relationship clinicians can now have with technology with a goal of helping them really become more efficient through implementing the integrated healthcare software solutions that you folks are providing. As we get into that today, let's start with describing for us, if you would, maybe the historic and even the current relationship to technology that you see most behavioral mental health settings having and maybe even some of the stats on the time currently being spent on charting, insurance, you know, filings, et cetera, patient care activities that are typically taking place outside of the therapy session. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to do that. You know, we've been focused on this part of healthcare for as long as NetSmart's been in business, which is a very long time. It's actually 50 plus years. And, you know, throughout that time, we've really been able to experience the history of the relationship that a behavioral or mental health provider has had with technology. And frankly, it's it's not always been the healthiest of relationships. Right. You know, I spend the majority of my day talking to behavioral health and mental health providers. And I think a lot of them would tell you that even up until today, technology has helped them to do a lot of things, right? It's yeah. helped with the portability of medical records, right? It's helped with continuity of care. It's certainly helped with things like uh, reimbursement and meeting regulatory challenges. But one of the things that we hear is that it doesn't necessarily make a behavioral health provider more efficient, and it doesn't necessarily make them happy. (laughs) And, you know, we we are on a mission to change those things. We, We believe that technology has advanced enough in today's market with things like natural language processing, voice to text, AI, and augmented intelligence that it can do those things. And technology no longer needs to be a box that is checked for any particular reason, but can truly be an enabler of better care. And, you know, some of the things that, that we hear, we actually worked with an organization called Open Minds to do a study of the way that the behavioral health providers spend a lot of their time. And uh, one of the most interesting or maybe even disturbing things that we learned is that the average behavioral health care provider spends 40% of their time on documentation, you know, and if you think about it, that's two days out of every work week that they're spending purely on notes and documentation and not doing the things that caused them to become a behavioral health provider in the first place. And that leads us to believe that maybe documentation is broken and there's a way that we could think about it differently. You know, I appreciate that piece. As a clinician, I've worked both in a a medical center, it's kind of where I grew up professionally, and also in private practice for the last 20, 25 years. And the most humbug part of our work is the very things you're talking about. Now, the technology is pretty cool. I was just out of state for a while. I was able to work on a part-time basis as I spent some of the holidays with family. So the portability of my work, the continuity of care that I was able to maintain was awesome. And so there's some aspects there that are really a cool piece, but I know you're talking about a number of other technological pieces that can actually enhance care from the health records to filing of claims and other things you guys do, we're going to get into in a minute, but I can certainly appreciate the amount of time 
required for documentation. I remember when I was in the medical center, we had a, a, numerous audits for accreditation purposes as a medical center as a whole. We were an APA accredited site as well. So we had requirements for lengthy notes for insurance billing purposes, for accreditation purposes, audit purposes. And I can't tell you the time required for some of these things to be completed in, in, in correct ways, let alone having to kind of cover yourself, you know, legally on top of that. So I'm sure these are some of the things you're talking about right now where the challenges lie. Yeah, it, it absolutely is, you know, and the, this type of technology has not always existed. Some of it is newer, you know, but some of these advances are things that it, it's time for this part of healthcare and, and for technology, it's time for that marriage to occur and yeah. to use these things in a way to make lives easier. Some of the things that we're talking about are, you know, if I am a behavioral health provider and I work for a part of a larger agency or, uh, you know, providing organization, then, you know, my, my notes, my documentation get reviewed. And that creates a lengthy process where I submit something. Perhaps I made a mistake, which is fine. I'm human, right? And it gets sent back to me. And then that's more time that I have to spend. There's absolutely no reason write that type of logic into a, a, a piece of software that is incredibly intuitive. So it's caught up front. At the same time, you know, if I'm a behavioral health provider, there's so many uh, phrases and there's so many things that I do right. repetitively, right? So, and there's so much that I have to do in terms of reviewing my old documentation and looking back at information like the medication that someone is on, yeah. or perhaps the objectives that I'm working on with that individual. And again, there's really no reason for the technology that I'm using to prompt me yeah. as I'm writing my notes. Did you work on these objectives? How did you make progress towards these interventions? Did you talk about these medications, right? Did you talk about these strengths? And the technology that we're talking about today creates sort of workflows and uses recommendations engines and AI to help a provider to create a better note, to create a more compliant note, and to do it a heck of a lot quicker. Yeah, I, I love that piece. I want to get into the AI part in just a moment. I love the idea, though, that the prompts you're talking about, the thoroughness of reminders or little nudges helps you be a better clinician too. It is cueing and it is, it is uh, an important piece. And I can literally nod my head when you're talking about 40% of our time is related to documentation, sitting down, doing the notes, insurance billing, not to mention some of the challenges if someone's seeing or receiving care across different agencies or different departments and the communication that's important to have clearly laid out and easily accessible. Absolutely. And, you know, really the purpose or the historical purpose of an EHR, right? Let's say an electronic health record mm -hmm. uh, over time has been to digitize the experience of a clinician and make that information accessible to them. But what many providers may see is that even though that information is, yes, it's technically in this piece of software that I'm using, is it presented to me in context? And is it presented to me in a way that supports my workflow and helps me to actually provide better care? To a large extent, it doesn't matter if this big mammoth database knows the medications that the individual that I'm working is taking or is on, if it doesn't present that to me while I'm meeting with them, right? When I'm meeting with an individual and I'm, when I'm working on my concurrent or post-documentation, I, I need to know that, right? I need that presented to me in context so it can help me to provide better care not so I can look it up after the fact. Yeah, I think that's that, that's outstanding. You know, I'm thinking, Brandon, too. I'm, I want to get in here, Dave, in just a moment into what are you guys doing specific? I want to get into the weeds yeah. a wee bit here because I think these things are so helpful to folks. And I think it's going to be very eye-opening. And I think it's going to maybe ease, my hope, is it's going to ease this transition for more and more to get involved in the technological side. But Brandon, I know that, you know, some of the partnerships we have, the folks that come and are part of our membership at Triad are looking for improving the ease of which they're able to practice as organizations, as clinicians. And this is kind of a really good fit, isn't it? Bringing NetSmart into a podcast like this, getting the news out there in those ways to really improve the life of those that are even coming through Triad. Yeah, absolutely. And we have at Triad, through Triad, the network that we provide, which is essentially the LinkedIn for behavior mental health yeah. 65,000 people now active in the platform, 200,000 people in our addressable database. And so I, like Dave, spend a lot of time talking to direct practitioners and yeah. you know, not to get too corporate speak here, but our purpose, the reason that we exist as an organization is to help people help people. Exactly. We are, we are not direct providers of care, yeah. but 
we are helping people, we are enabling those who do. And so I think it is it is very core to our purpose, to our mission, Absolutely. serving the behavioral mental health professional community to connect people with organizations like NetSmart yeah. that are trying to leverage technology to improve the delivery of care and, for both sides. Yeah, and, and I think just to, Dave, to provide a little uh, validation here, uh, what you're saying resonates with me, with the conversations that I have regularly. Technology is, I think, in the behavioral health space is seen as, I don't know how necessary and I don't know how evil, but maybe those two things go together, right? I, sure, I think it is not a delighter. It is not an enabler. It is become right. something that is done in a perfunctory way because they need to record notes to be able to, yeah. to bill or because something went wrong in how they recorded, uh, used a code. And so they need to follow up on that. And the percentage of time spent in documentation is something we hear from folks all the time. Yeah. And, and all of those things are, are relevant needs, right? You, you need to bill, right? You need to meet regulatory requirements, right? Yes. You need to ensure continuity of care. And I think our point is that technology has existed to support those things for a, a long time now. Technology has not necessarily existed truly to serve a clinician and to be sort of a, what I'll call an AI documentation assistant for a provider of care. And I think the challenge that we're making uh, with one, some of the things that we're working on is that the time for that to be the case is now. And if you are a behavioral health and a mental or a mental health provider, it's time to start thinking about these things. And if you are a, a member of a larger agency, it's time to challenge your agency to provide you these tools. You know, the thing that we haven't talked about yet is the rising demand for behavioral health services across the country and frankly, across the world, somewhat as a result of the ongoing pandemic and the lack of a large provider pool to be able to provide the amount of services that are needed across the country. And if that is the case, then it's time to start demanding technology yeah. to make you more efficient, to reduce your burnout, and to help you to provide more care to those that desperately need it. I think that's a great point. The, the, the need for mental health services is just exploded and it's only going to be going up. And that what you're saying right there, in order to meet that need, we have to be doing some supportive services better. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to meet that need. If we're spending 40% of our time outside the therapy session. Yeah. That's ridiculous. We can't do that kind of work. And I love, Brandon, what you're reintroducing here is transmission. The core of it is helping people help people. And that's really what you're talking about. The same thing here, Dave, is we're helping clinicians be more efficient and more productive. So the clinicians help the people that they want to be serving. So give us some examples of the myriad offerings that NetSmart is bringing to improve not just patient care, but simplifying administration. Sure. So, so NetSmart's like I, like I said, NetSmart has been in this space for over 50 years, and certainly a lot has changed since then. You know, some of the things that we're doing include things like workforce management solutions to make people uh, more efficient or just get them to a, a, the right place at the right time. You know, more consumer engagement tools to engage folks in their in their healthcare. But really, what I wanted to talk about today, and what I've been you know, alluding to for uh, most of the conversation, is, is a tool that's called Bells.ai. We'd love to hear uh, about that. So Bells is the first and only behavioral health AI documentation assistant. It's smart, it's intuitive, it's seamless. And, you know, it's meant to do a couple of things. It's really meant to fix this problem statement that we put out there of documentation is broken. And so first, it, it helps a provider to capture the information that they need to where they are. So if you're out in the field, if you're at a library, if you're in a consumer's home, or even if you're in an office setting, we can do that. So if you're jotting down notes on your phone, you can support that. If you don't have an internet connection, we can support that. If you want to jot a, take up a photo of a medication or anything, yeah. we can do that. You know, if you want to use voice to text on your phone, we can do that, right? What your preference is to gather information as a provider, we yeah. want to support that preference because we think that preference is important. So that's number one is assist in that sort of information capture and do it in a really seamless and easy to use way. The second thing is to help with data accuracy, right? So how do we turn that information into an accurate piece of clinical documentation or a note? And it's simple things like, you know, proofing grammar and spelling. Tools like Grammarly have existed outside of healthcare for a long time. Why not have similar tools that are uh, focused towards behavioral care? 
And so it does that, right? It, it proofs your grammar, it proofs your, you know, not just from an English language uh, standpoint, right. but from a clinical really uh, vocabulary good. standpoint, yeah. and then uh, allows you to leverage information that's specific to you. If you're doing like a sort of community treatment, right? What are the, the, the pieces of language that are specific to that program? If you're doing, you know, sort of some more traditional outpatient services, what are the language that is specific there? And then, and then using things like fact checking against mm -hmm. the rest of the individual's chart, like their diagnosis, like their treatment plan, like their medications to make sure that everything is clinically relevant, right? So Very that's good. number two is helping with that accuracy. And then finally is really where the AI kicks in and that's the recommendation engine. So yeah. we're able to use contextual information about the individual, about the services that they're receiving, about the programs that they're enrolled in to really embed that clinical support to provide the ability to create a better note. And some really simple examples are, you know, in some programs, it's, it's not really appropriate to transport someone from one place to another, but it is fine to accompany them. So yeah. how do we make sure that we're providing that recommendation? Right? Or how do we make sure that we're including must have blocks of text, right? So yeah. things that really need to be a part of the note to provide that sort of seamless approach and you know, make sure that it's good from a quality perspective. And so that's really what we're talking about here. It, it does a couple of things. Number one, by using all of these different sort of tips and tricks and helpful yeah. things, it really cuts down on the amount of time it takes to create a note. Yeah. And then by building in this decision support and by using AI, it helps to make sure that it's a high quality note and we can really, really cut down on the amount of back and forth that is needed for something to be approved. And we can eliminate situations where when the ominous audit comes around, and, you know, I start looking at documentation and finding that things aren't necessarily, you know, supportive of, of the service that was delivered. So all of this technology exists today and is something that at least in the, the organizations that we're, we're working with, we're our providers are, are finding really helpful. And a lot like Brandon and, and Triad's mission of uh, helping people help people, uh, yeah. that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Absolutely. You know, this word smart keeps coming up. Good, good job putting that in the company's name here. This idea, <laughs> the idea, this is so smart. You're talking about not just time reduction, but you're talking about safeguarding clinicians. You're talking about enhancing continuity of care, but you're also talking about enhancing the quality of care Mm -hmm. that a patient can be receiving because sometimes, you know, when you're doing your note or you're thinking things, you've got, you know, 25 people this week and you're, you're, you're kind of sometimes thinking narrowly, but when these things are cued or these options are presented to you, you get to think more, you know, broadly. And I think get to provide, you know, maybe other thoughts you haven't thought of before about what could be included in this care or maybe what this patient might be needing. This is really, really a thorough program, isn't it? It is. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that, that we've just gotten great feedback with. And so, you know, we're really appreciative of this forum to uh, try and get the word out and, and share it with, with more providers. And we're seeing that, yeah, this absolutely has a profound clinical impact in terms of increased quality of care, but then also the increased access to care, yes. right? You know, it helps providers with, to help increase staff capacity, even in a difficult hiring market, right? It helps improve ramp up time. There's a lot of, there's a huge amount of turnover in this space. Yes. And so, Anything that we can do to help providers to get more productive more quickly, we want to do. And this yeah. helps with that. It also helps with improved morale. Mm -hmm. Provider burnout, especially in today's world, is a real thing. It's and huge. you know, while we can't necessarily always help our clients to do some of the things that makes the providers uh, more happy, we can help them use technology to improve morale and reduce turnover. So there's real clinical impacts, but you know, we're also seeing financial impacts, right? Increasing access to care, you know, helps from a financial standpoint, you know, getting to a, an approved note improves, you know, helping to increase the quality of a note helps reduce the risk of recruitment. So using technology in this way, we're finding has benefits across the board. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Behavioral and mental health professionals provide critical support to our communities in a time when our communities need it more than ever, but they need support too to continue their education, to connect with colleagues, and to advance their career. And so we've launched Triad, the hub for behavioral and mental health professionals. At Triad, you'll find education, community, and career resources for both current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, all curated specifically for you and all for free. Visit us at hellotriad.com bht to register for your free professional account. 
Again, that's hellotriad.com slash BHT. Come join the community today. I think those secondary and tertiary gains, sometimes we don't think, you know, about as clearly we just think, well, I want to be, you know, more efficient or I want to spend less time. But you watch these the, kind of the rippling effect of the things you're doing and the tools you have. In addition to the AI, I know you guys do benchmarking where you're mm -hmm. able to compare an organization's financial and operational and clinical performance metrics with your healthcare benchmark tools yep. or the care coordination where you guys are able to help folks track services and the treatments for individuals across care settings or your data analytics where you're providing at a glance, you know, metrics to clinical, financial and operational decision markers and virtual care, the workforce management that you mentioned earlier, and uh, just, you know, allowing for electronic accurate, you know, visit verifications. And you guys got some really keen technological responses to enhance this provision of care on, on, on a multi-layered basis. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. It really is. I'm it's, curious, you know, we talked about what historically has been taking place and this idea that the relationship between technology and behavioral and, and human health services can be enhanced. As you're watching folks implement NetSmart services, what are some of the results you're seeing in terms of yeah. time spent, reimbursement, et cetera? What are you noticing there? Sure. So this tool that we've been talking about, Bells, we've seen a, a huge impact. So I'll, I'll let you know a couple of key metrics. But um, the first one is for those that have implemented this tool, they've seen a, a reduction in the average time from the session being completed to mm -hmm. a note being uh, finalized. We're seeing that reduced by an average of 56%, right? So <laughs> cut more than in half, which is, is yeah. a huge benefit. We're seeing the a faster reimbursement submission on an average of a day and a half, which for a behavioral health organization, which is often a nonprofit with really, yes. really tight margins, is can be can can be huge. How about in terms of just uh, you know yeah. the time taken to create a note? Absolutely. So this is the one that I think we're most proud of. We've seen a decrease in the amount of time uh, that it takes just to create the average note by sixty seven percent. Yeah, phenomenal. Which is a huge amount of time. So if we can take that forty percent of time spent on documentation exactly. and even cut it in half, it's yeah. huge. Yeah, that's significant. You got to be getting some people singing your praises here. What kind of uh, what kind of feedback are you getting from folks that are implementing this, and what are you hearing from them specifically? Yeah, it's it's another sort of uh, really really key point. The metrics are one thing, but the yeah. human impact is 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 even more important. So I have a couple of uh, quotes that I want to share. I love the to first hear them. is from. Um, directly from a clinician. And this is one of my favorite. It says, when I'm done with work, I leave. I don't stay there until 6.30 finishing my note. Thanks to Bells, I walk out the door at five o'clock, right? And who wouldn't amazing. love to work? Yeah. The next one we have is from a case manager. And uh, our case manager said, this saves me hours, you know, which is another great one. And then finally, you know, this is more from a leadership perspective of a larger provider organization. But uh, so this is directly from a CEO. We're seeing a quicker ramp up to billing. At this rate, mm -hmm. we could have every employee billing at full capacity in three weeks. Yeah, that's outstanding. Yeah, that's outstanding. Yeah. So, not just, you know, not really that stats. Yeah, but the feedback is amazing. Yeah, the feedback is fantastic. And, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's especially that first one of, you know, yeah. walking out the door at five o'clock. <laughs> right. It's, um, you know, something as something that, that, that Brandon had said earlier around, you know, technology, maybe not being evil and maybe not being necessary, but we can link those words together. Some, a lot of the, the, the term that we like to use here at NetSmart is a technology tax. And we never want our technology to be a technology tax. We want it to be an enabler of a better workflow, an enabler of a better experience, and frankly, a life improvement. And if mm -hmm. I, if we can take a clinician that you know had to work, like, you know, maybe couldn't get home to be with their family, and we can allow them to do that through the use yeah. of technology, we'll do that ten times out of ten. Yeah, that's really good. If we wanted to look at maybe reframing, Dave, the idea of that technology tax, and and in terms of maybe nudging the rethinking of implementing technology into the behavioral health and human services field, how might you challenge practitioners and organizations, even those listening in today, to think about improving the efficiency of their programs with technology? Absolutely. I think the first thing to do is I would just challenge you to rethink your yeah. relationship with technology and specifically your relationship with technology as it relates to your career, right? Your professional life. You know, one of the things that, that one of the turns that we made at NetSmart, oh, maybe about a, a year or so ago, is that we don't think when we're talking about usability or when we're talking about 
the intuitiveness of a piece of software. We don't necessarily comp think we're competing with other providers of behavioral health technology, at least as it relates to usability. We're competing with the, tech, the rest of the technology a provider uses in their life. So that means that if, if I'm creating a piece of technology to do a, a progress note, yeah. it doesn't have to be better than the other progress note tool, right? It doesn't have to be as intuitive as the other progress note tool. It has to be as intuitive as and easy to use as buying something on Amazon, because that's where that yeah. comparison comes from. Yeah. And so, you know, the first thing is just, I would challenge you to rethink your relationship with technology and that it has advanced to the point where it doesn't have to be a confrontational relationship. Yeah. Technology exists to be able to support your workflow and to make your life better, just like how technology in our personal lives can sometimes make our lives better. And so that would be number one. And then number two, if you're a, if you're a member of a sort of larger provider organization, I would say go challenge that organization to mm -hmm. think about the types of technology that, that can help you to do this. Um, that's the majority of our clients, right? The majority of NetSmart clients are provider organizations, Medicaid providers. And, you know, one thing that they all have in common is that their number one inhibitor to growth today is not the demand for more services. It's the availability of resources to deliver those services. They all have pages upon pages of job yeah. leads. And oftentimes with a, a lack of, of folks to go uh, recruit to fill those job openings. But challenge that provider organization to invest in the technology to make you more efficient. Because if we can take five providers and make them 20% more efficient, oh, yeah. that's another provider. And you know we can choose what to do with that capacity. We can give it back to providers to, to help prevent burnout and things like that. Or we can use it to improve access to care. But either way, if the technology exists, which it does, yes. uh, and the need is there, which I believe it is, then there's no reason to not challenge your organization to make this investment with you. Yeah, that, I think that's a great challenge, Dave. And I think it's a great an inviting reframe of how to be thinking about this in, in, in a really usable and inviting way. So I, I, I appreciate that. What's being shared here makes sense to me from a clinician's point of view. I'm curious, Brandon, you know, from your seat in your position with Triad, as you lead this organization and you work with other organizations, the people that come through our system, what are you seeing its application being? Yeah, thanks, Graham. And what Dave is saying really does resonate with me around how clinicians perceive technology mm -hmm. uh, today and, and how that can, and I would argue, really needs to change. You know, we're humans. We have mental models of things. That's just how we are able to interface with the world around us. I think that's a, a necessary mechanism that is very human. But when we talk to clinicians, practicing clinicians, and we ask them about technology and how technology serves them today, typically the two things they're thinking about is their EHR and whatever they're using to deliver teletherapy. Those are the two answers that we get. That's right. And I, I think people aren't thinking about some things that Dave said around, you know, AI, natural language processing, voice to text, having a recommendation engine. Yeah. I also think that people, when they hear AI, that sounds like, you know, scary, the robots are taking us over in the, in the future, but it's, it's real and it's here today and it's helping real people as you just, as you just heard from Dave. So one of the things we're trying to do in connecting the audience that's on triad, the, the tens of thousands of practicing clinicians today, we're trying to connect them with people who can help maybe shift that mental model a little bit, can, can say, when you think technology, don't think just those experiences with technology. Think about what technology can do today in new ways that that may really change your relationship with it and with your client base. What I think is an important piece about that is when we've thought about technology to date, and because it was so new, it was really clunky. You know, it was it was hard to it's hard to work and all the things that are necessary. What I love that Dave is sharing with us is that they have found a way to simplify that process, which is what you're encouraging right here. And outside just you know, electronic health records or, you know, having a portal with which to do, you know, online sessions, telemental health. But there are these other very supportive, very enhancing services that they offer as well. Yeah, that's right. And I think, and this is maybe if, if you'll permit me um, musing for a second, but when we think about the therapeutic model, yes, therapeutic methods have changed. But the therapeutic model of two or more people sitting together in a room talking to one another with maybe one of them taking notes, mm -hmm. that has been largely unchanged for decades. 
right? The core, the core nature of how therapy is, is delivered and consumed. And I mean, if you contrast that with the medical model, you know, where doctors and nurses, the way they interface with the patient, all the vitals that are taken, like the, the way that happens, the way technology is just in the, the OR or the ER or the really intake in. room, it's really built in. And I think that that, that means that the, our behavioral mental health practitioner community hasn't been welcomed into technology the way that some of their counterparts in, in the medical side have, have been. And yeah. so I do really think that the work that NetSmart and other organizations, organizations were trying to, to connect with clinicians through yes. Triad and through our network of partners are, are, change, are really changing the way that technology supports both clinicians and patients and can, can really have a new relationship with it, hopefully as a result. And what my thinking about that is kind of, kind of dovetailing off of that is the model needs to change. That's not a sustainable model given the amount of services that are being requested right now. And if 40% of what we're doing is spent you know, on the humbug parts of it, we're, we're not going to be efficient to meet the need that's there. So what you're raising here as well is this allows us to be not just more productive and being able to go home early type of thing, though those are important things, but we get to service patients in a much more thorough and in larger numbers as well. Yeah, that's right. If you think about the number of available person hours yeah. for delivery of care. Yeah. If we're not getting more people into the field, and we're trying to do that through Triad too, we're trying to bring more people into Baver Mental Health, but That's right. until and unless we're able to do that, that number of person hours is essentially a fixed number unless mm -hmm. persons are working more hours, which That's leads to it. burnout. And so if you can reduce the number of person hours that would otherwise be spent on non-care related activities, you actually can increase the number of people you can care for. And yeah, that's really good. That's what NetSmart is trying to do. And I, I think that's frankly at a, at a certain level, what we're, we're trying to do through Triad too. I can't think of a better mission for both organizations, helping people help people, but I can't think of a better mission for practitioners to truly benefit from these services in a way that's going to make their practices not just more efficient, but like you're saying, m much more enjoyable in the process of doing it. As we're kind of kind of rounding the corner here and coming home, I'd, I'd love our listeners to get some resources from you on how to learn more about these emerging technologies for mental health and, and human services and where they can learn more about NetSmart. So give us some resources if you would, please. Yeah, I'd love to. So you can visit us online. Our website is uh, www. Uh, .ntsd.com. If you want to learn more about Bells specifically, just go search for bells.ai okay. uh, and that'll take you to a page specifically for Bells that provides a lot of great information. A couple other ways or, or things that we're doing upcoming that, that will help you to learn more. We're doing a, a live webinar with the Open Minds uh, that's coming up on February 8th that we, we encourage our, our listeners here to register for if you want to learn more maybe even see a, a demonstration of what we're talking about. And then we'll be attending the Open Minds Conference that uh, occurs the following week of the 14th. And then we will also be at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, which is happening in, in April, which I know probably many of our, of our listeners are, are aware of and uh, will be planning on attending as well. So uh, the resources are many, and sure. we'd love a direct conversation with anyone who's interested. In Fantastic. Well, Dave, you guys have done a really nice job of making truly integrated care a reality now for folks to check out and to implement. And I, I appreciate you walking us through the, the various uh, opportunities that they can benefit from in their practice and organizations as well. Dave Brandon, it's been great to have you with us. Brandon, nice to have you back on the show today. Thanks, Graham. Happy to be here. Great to have you here. Dave, thank you so much again. And we'll look forward to having you back and seeing what new services are being provided and update what you guys are doing to improve this uh, integrated care that we have an opportunity to benefit from. So thank you for joining us today on the show. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and I'd, I'd love the opportunity to be back. We'd love to have you back. We will have you back. That'd be great. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Dave, Brandon, and myself today. It's always great having you with us. I want to remind you that this episode, its resources, and all of our other shows can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. So check out our webpage, triadhq.com slash BHT and explore our archive of podcasts and resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavior Health Today.
We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.